As we've seen in our last time together, if we're to believe Schopenhauer, life isn't something exactly to be celebrated. We are, in fact, victims of life. And if you're going to talk about the human predicament, that predicament is that we're living at all. That actually it would have been best if we'd never been born. It's not as if there's a meaning to life. We may take a journey in order to find it, and then finding it will be transformed. If we look into the heart of Schopenhauer's thought, there is no meaning to life. But here we are anyway, and it's on balance a good thing if we don't linger here terribly long. The meaning of life is partly the discovery there is no meaning to our lives, and that perhaps the best thing is an exit. Speaking simply, what an awful mess to be in. What a terrible situation. If there ever was pessimism, this is it. This is Schopenhauer's pessimism. Now, under the axial model of philosophy that we've looked at uh, as a guide to living, where we're on a journey and we're trying to find our way to reality, well, in terms of that, we have a notion of deliverance, uh, a deliverance from the human predicament. And that deliverance is often understood as escaping ignorance. But maybe the deliverance needs to be something else. Now, because philosophy has primarily been rational and primarily emphasized the benefits of thought, usually the philosophical concern has been with that very predicament of ignorance. And it's thought by many that what's involved is a distinction between our lower natures and our higher natures, and that we have both lower and higher natures. And typically, our lower nature is viewed, well, either as bad in itself or less negatively as tending to distract us from the things that matter, the things that could transform us. Predecessors to Schopenhauer, for instance, both Kant and Hegel, who have become, in a way, old friends of ours, provide accounts of a kind of deliverance we might have from ignorance and a transformation our, of our lives to a higher level. Remember that Kant says that there could be a rational, moral life. There could be a life in which, in fact, we would find our duty, we would act under the proper motives, we would live with a rational morality, we would keep our desires subsumed and in order, and that would relieve us of the dangers and the distractions of desire and allow us better to have awe and wonder and think of questions, though we can't answer them, or nonetheless questions that make us fully human to ask. Hegel distinguishes between our ordinary life in the world and our philosophical comprehension of the world. And what Hegel thinks is that we are at a higher level. We have overcome ignorance and the confusion and the loud noise and roar of an often kind of confusing history if we can understand a narrative story that tells why history has come where it has, what our place can be in it, and what history means. So in both cases, Kant, rational morality, that might have rationally religious consequences. Hegel, a comprehension of the journey of the human spirit. We do have the notion of deliverance from ignorance and a movement toward maybe at least an elevating insight, maybe not necessarily a transforming one. Both of these conceptions, whether Kant's or Hegel's, actually derive from a kind of psychology found in Plato where we have at the highest level reason, then we have our will and our will power, and beneath that we have desires. And in the best of worlds, reason rules, it guides the will 
and our will takes care of, controls, moderates our desires. It's different in Schopenhauer. In Schopenhauer, and we're going to see this, his views do become terribly influential. Knowledge that overcomes ignorance regarding our human situation. That's not enough. We can know all the sorts of things he's already told us that we've talked about in the previous lecture. But that knowledge in itself won't be enough to have. It won't get the job done. And that's even further pessimism. Schopenhauer, as we know, has talked about how there's this pulsing desire, this energy craving satisfaction in us. And now that we know that, what do we do? And Schopenhauer says, knowing it, as he says he's told us, isn't enough. It isn't going to solve the problem. What Schopenhauer does tell us is that when you come right down to it, knowledge is just simply the unwitting tool of the activities of the will, of the activities of this pulsing energy within us. I think there's a very nice way to illustrate this. It comes from a novel that I believe won the National Book Award. The novel is From Here to Eternity, and its author is James Jones. Not only did I read the novel, but I saw the movie, and in my era it was a different set of actors who played in it. Uh, but in any case, if you look closely at that novel, there's a particular scene that I think is very revealing, and you could almost say it's out of Schopenhauer. A sergeant comes to the home of the captain of the base. The captain of the base is not home, but in that home is the captain's wife. And the captain's wife and the sergeant sit and chat with each other. And actually, it's a fairly sophisticated conversation. Well, it's complicated anyway, because they're talking about, guess what? Philosophy. And you could almost say, through philosophy, they're talking about what the meaning of life might be. Maybe it doesn't go quite that far, but that element is in it. Well, at one point, the wife of the captain starts to take off her clothes. And she says to the sergeant, isn't this really what our conversation is about? All this fancy talk we've been having about philosophy and ideas, isn't this really what is going on between us? Well, I won't go any further in the story except to tell you it might be saved from X rating because what actually happens is that they hear a crunch of gravel in the driveway because the captain's coming back. Full stop, the sergeant leaves, and the rest is history. What Schopenhauer would have said about this is, ah, nearly a perfect model of what human life is like. There are these underlying magnetisms, these underlying desires. It's awkward for us to talk about them, but they're always there. We often live in a fancy world of ideas. We get articulate. We talk about grand things. We get analytical. We get reflective. But beneath it all, and we all know it every day in every part of our lives, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be sexual parts. Every time we pass a particular restaurant, I won't name any here, but or any particular place to get coffee, or any particular place where a desire of ours might be satisfied, what happens? Ah, yes. What happens is that we're reminded that these are the sorts of desires and things that are us, and if we could admit it to ourselves, rule us. Let's consider further. Schopenhauer thinks that knowledge is controlled by and doesn't itself control the will. Strictly speaking, he thinks knowledge, like Kant did, is restricted to appearances and offers explanations that don't reach reality. Now, Schopenhauer does claim to have a kind of wisdom regarding human life. Though he says knowledge isn't the cure, Schopenhauer isn't going to leave us absolutely 
at sea, he does have some solutions, some remedies. If life is the disease, and importantly Schopenhauer thinks it is, Schopenhauer often speaks and offers cures or a cure. He says that the world that we experience, we understand materialistically. Uh, but he claims the world couldn't be a material world. There's got to be something behind it. He says if you think about causality, if you think about the presence of forces in nature, uh, a, a material account will finally not add up. But he doesn't go into that in any great detail. He tells us that there are basic categories our minds have to use. We have to think of things as being in space. We have to think about them as being in time. We have to use causal notions. We think of inner motivations. But those categories only give us the appearance of things, never their underlying reality. Now, in some ways, in some of the things that Schopenhauer is saying, he anticipates some developments in contemporary science. And with respect to what he says about the agony of what is the deepest in us, in some ways he anticipates some things that are said by the great psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who we'll be talking about in a later lecture. We might pause for a moment just to realize that Schopenhauer leaves us in fundamental underlying dilemmas. We know appearance, but it couldn't be reality. Our own experience of our secret inner life, secret in the sense it would probably embarrass us to talk about it, is really the experience of reality. Well, what to do? How to get some kind of cure for what could almost be called the disease of living? Well. Let's consider this one further. Let's see where he can take us. He says this will, this underlying energy, is something to be escaped. It's not something to be embraced. And he thinks there are four methods we might use in order to escape it. We need to escape the destructive ravages of the will because of the very account Schopenhauer has given us of its nature. He says this will is not progressive. It isn't as in Hegel that there's this grand journey of the spirit going through stages. As we know, Hegel thought that by the 19th century, happy, happy, and for us even more so, all these stages have been gone through and we can celebrate them. Our imagination can allow us to recapitulate them. We can enjoy them. We can say we've arrived. Oh no. Schopenhauer says history isn't really going anywhere. All the scientific and technological progress there ever could be, we're not going anywhere. Here we are, it's too bad that we're here, but we're not going anywhere in the sense of a progress of history. And Schopenhauer also says that this underlying energy, which he calls the will, as I said before, it's insatiable. Every satisfaction leaves you probably temporarily, maybe, if you're lucky, satisfied, then bored, then the desire comes back. Or maybe you don't get the satisfaction that you need or that you want, and it could even be an unexpectedly painful satisfaction. So in a way, what Schopenhauer is saying is, our life is a life of deep, agonizing frustration. The meaning of life, no meaning. The pursuit of the meaning of life, well, our pursuit should be to be delivered from the human predicament. And that predicament, again, is that here we are. The predicament is not that we don't know enough. The predicament is that we live at all. Now, I hope by now you've got some sense of why I say Schopenhauer pretty pessimistic guy. Well, he does offer four methods of escape from the influence of this pulsing energy we call the will. And 
as we'll see, each has to a certain degree significant limitations. How to be delivered from our pulsing energy that is the depth of us, how to get beyond it, realizing that that's what the pulsing course of history is. Well, the first of the solutions that Schopenhauer suggests is what we might call aesthetic contemplation. Though he tells us that aesthetic contemplation, well, its effectiveness is pretty temporary. For example, we can get our mind off things, say by, well, seeing a movie, though there weren't movies, of course, in Schopenhauer's day, the kinds of examples he might give would be looking at paintings, that maybe if we get absorbed in something, we'll temporarily at least get our minds off the kind of underlying agony that is the constant companion of our lives. But he says that this spectatorial nature of contemplation, which diverts us from our underlying urgent drives and is the heart of our will's dynamics, well, it's kind of fleeting. You can't sustain it. The energy required to sustain a contemplative life of aesthetic contemplation is kind of insufficient. It's insufficient to the task. Uh, the notions of disengagement and getting one's mind off one's real life, those notions, uh, they illustrate what he means by the aesthetic, but he tells, it, tells us at the same breath, it doesn't get the job done. But try it anyway. It might be helpful for a while. The second suggestion Schopenhauer makes is the cultivation of sympathy for one's fellow beings. But that could be another avenue of escape. But he says its effectiveness is also temporary. It's Schopenhauer's view that we might recognize that each individual not just me, you, anyone we know, is an expression, an instance of this pulsing energy, this craving that is the will. And that means that all of us suffer as manifestations of this. We suffer the same agonies. And maybe realizing that, having sympathy for the fact we're all together in this, and it's an awful thing to be in, but we're in it and in it together and we might as well realize actually we're all suffering. Schopenhauer th thinks that that will also, in a way, however temporarily, alleviate this sense of underlying agony of desires felt, denied, desires we try to hide from ourselves, desires that we live with and don't know what to do with. Maybe a sense of sympathy that that's everybody's situation might be a partial, partial alleviation. Not a cure, but at least something that temporarily will help us along. And perhaps that will engender a kind of non-competitive quietism that will temporarily assuage this gnawing, desirous nature that we have. It's a large moment in the history of the development of European thought when Schopenhauer tells us that the third avenue, the first being aesthetic contemplation, fleeting, but gets our mind off things, the second being a sympathy, a knowledge that we're all stuck we're all in it together. We all suffer. Well, the third is music. He thinks that music has a special capacity uh, to capture the rhythms of our underlying will, the rhythms of this pulsing energy within us. That this music, if it's the right sort of music and we listen to it in the right way, 
might assuage the agonies of our will. What Schopenhauer actually believes is that music is noumenal. That's an old word we've looked at before from Kant. It means that music is, puts us in touch with reality itself. And as we fuse with music, we experience reality itself through us. But in an assuaging way, it calms us or can calm us. Uh, a major power that music has is to circumvent our intellects. Music for Schopenhauer is not meant to make us know anything. It's to get us away from thinking about anything, much less trying to know something. And he thinks that music speaks in a language that can and does put us more at one with ourselves. I must say it probably gives away my age that a lot of the music that I listen to myself doesn't exactly make me one with myself, but, well, I won't go very far into that. A very famous German composer of the 19th century is Richard Wagner, and he's probably known a great deal for various operas that he wrote. Now, it turned out that Wagner read Schopenhauer's philosophy. Remember, I said before that the world as will and representation was written by Schopenhauer in 1818. I told you that very few people read it, paid attention to it, but Wagner did, and Wagner was enthralled by it. We can guess why, because it said that music put us in touch with reality itself. And even if you understand reality to be this pulsing energy that agonizes its craving way through us, even if you understand it in that way, music can assuage that. Music can calm that. And of course, and we're going to look at this a little later when we're together, Wagner thought, yes, his music did that. Schopenhauer was right about what music could do, and Wagner thought that Wagner's own music accomplished that. Schopenhauer also thought on a less, I suppose, deep level that music was a way of engendering in us also some wants, playing them out, and then bringing them to closure and satisfaction. He had the idea that music could also not just calm us, but capture rhythms in the underlying will that is our nature. And by capturing those rhythms, in some way bring a more rhythmic quality to our living, which would make it less brutally a matter of cravings and desires and what to do about them. But it turns out that the very best, though the most challenging strategy that Schopenhauer puts before us, is the idea, hold your breath now, take a breath, Schopenhauer thinks the best we might do is lose the will to live. Oh my. Schopenhauer thinks perhaps the best of all the remedies for the disease called life and its agonies would be to reach a condition of quiescence, a certain kind of mellow and benign passivity where our individual wills don't toss and turn us anymore. That we, in a way, don't allow anything to matter to us, even our very selves. It's his view that the loss of the will to live is not the same as the desire to commit suicide. For Maybe only a philosopher can say this. Philosophers say such strange things. Suicide, he says, would be an act of will. Well, we ought to scratch our heads. If life is such a mess, such an agony, why does it have to be the case that if we commit suicide, which would put us out of our agony, it would be the wrong thing to do because that would be giving in to the will and acting on it? I won't pursue that any further other than to tell you that for Schopenhauer, no, no, it isn't that you would ever commit suicide. 
what you would do is reach that benign and mellow point where things didn't matter anymore, even yourself. And if even you yourself didn't matter anymore, it wouldn't be important. It wouldn't be an important thing to do even to commit suicide, because even committing suicide wouldn't matter. Let's pause for a moment now and consider then where we stand. This is an odd place to be. We can have knowledge of something called the human predicament, but we want to pause and consider what it means. The human predicament is that we are victims of life. Life itself is the disease, and we need a cure from that disease. And all the knowledge in the world won't bring about the cure. Let's consider further. Schopenhauer brings a, a very strongly negative and pessimistic element into European philosophical thinking. He tempers the rationalism and the celebration of the spirit and the optimism of the 18th century enlightenment. He tempers the enthusiasm of Hegel and the idea that we can be spectators and even in small ways participants in the grand story of history. He tempers anything looking like a utopian hope, not only for the world, but for any one of us living our individual lives. And what he gives us is a subterranean, painfully hidden, or maybe even more painfully not hidden, non-rational reality that is us, that is our core. And that, for Schopenhauer, is what the issue and the predicament of life is. The notion of a higher realm beyond this one or after this one is rejected. That isn't what Schopenhauer thinks would be there. He's very agnostic about it. He doesn't give it very much thought. And the parallels with Eastern philosophy, with Buddhism, uh, are quite strong. And they suggest that the meaning of life, if we can say there is one, is, well, it's to achieve peace of mind, a kind of disengagement from the cycle or the painful rhythms of desire, satisfaction of desire, failure to satisfy desire, failure to admit that when all is said and done, what we don't really think finally matters is knowledge. What we do think finally matters is getting our desires satisfied, and life continues to tell us it's a painful enterprise, and it doesn't very often work out well. I mentioned before, Schopenhauer is very taken with Buddhist doctrines. And as I said before, he probably was the major figure, the influential figure, who brought Buddhist thinking to the West in a way that made it spread. And if we reflect just a minute on what that thinking tells us and the message that it gives us, what is it? It's that life is suffering, and to be alive is to suffer. It's the message that suffering, well, that's brought about by desire. And desire does have a cure, and the cure is no longer to be attached. And therefore, as we move toward the end of our consideration of Schopenhauer, what we have to reflect on most centrally is that for Schopenhauer, it is our own inner desires that are reality itself manifesting itself through us. It is those desires that we must lose our attachment to. We must become, in a mellow and benign way, no longer caring, no longer concerned, because all that does is bring hurt and bring pain. 
So it is a disengagement, Schopenhauer recommends. It is a sense that there is no meaning of life, but here we are, and we can find a way to come to terms, to become mellow, to become no longer involved, not only in questions about the meaning of life, but we can become less concerned about the world itself. Well, we need now to turn our attention in a different direction, nearly the opposite from Schopenhauer, because as we return to talk to each other again, we're going to be looking at someone who plunges very directly into a consideration of the world, the so-called real world, and that thinker is Karl Marx.